After their extended trip throughout the Pacific Theater, the team's next stop was Arizona, where they were recording sounds of both Japanese and American machine guns. We're in uh, Wickenburg, Arizona. Arizona is one of the states in our great nation that will allow our Second Amendment rights, the fact that we can keep and bear arms and we can come out to the desert out here where it's absolutely arid and no people are around and we can fire what weapons we need to fire. This is the Lewis gun. This one happens to be in 30-06. The weapon list is kind of varying based on the suppliers that we have that can provide the weapons for us, but they encompass allied handguns, rifles, submachine guns, all the way up to a 50 millimeter water-cooled machine gun. And we'll basically spend two days in the, out in the desert with the audio team, as well as a guy that works on special effects for us, a couple of character guys, and some animation people. That water-cooled machine gun was the same type used to fend off Japanese Zeros during the attack on Pearl Harbor. This is really cool. This is the water-cooled 50 caliber that we're going to be using on the deck of the California for the Pearl Harbor level. It took a lot of phone calls to get this one on set, so we're really, really excited to be out here filming this stuff today. <laughs> They also brought along two Japanese actors and some actual Marines who were dressed in period uniforms. Yeah, I'm aiming, I'm aiming low on Those guys will be the ones firing the weapons, so when the animation team has to go back and choreograph that scene, they can just look at this video footage that we took in Arizona and put it together. And at the same time, the character team will look at all the lights and everything and see how it's reflecting. And the special effects guy will be able to see how the muzzle blast will appear and what the recoil will look like. And the audio team will be able to get an exact representation for how that weapon in particular sounds. This is a U.S. rifle caliber 30 M1. Fires at a muzzle velocity of about 2,800 feet per second. There's a maximum effective range. Supervising the entire operation was military consultant Captain Dale Dye. I spent 21 years in the United States Marine Corps. When I retired from active service, I was a tremendous movie fan, in particular war movies. And what I found was that what I was seeing was not what I experienced. It wasn't the real thing. So I made up my mind that I was going to go to Hollywood and fix that. And so my thought was that just as we do in military training, you immerse the person in the lifestyle of a combat infantryman and then let him bring the truth to the screen. That was my theory. Everyone in Hollywood said, well, that's not necessary. It's called acting, Captain Die. Captain Dye went on to work with some of the biggest Hollywood directors. We began to experiment with doing a first-person, really accurate World War II video game. When Steven Spielberg and Tom Hanks and I were in England and Ireland doing Saving Private Ryan, Steven Spielberg is a bit of a video game nut himself, and he brought me down there and he said, listen, we are going to design from the ground up a video game based on real-world World War II experiences. Left-handed, never shot a gun right-handed before. You never shot a what? Weapon. Sorry, weapon. Get over there. Just get down on your face. Since the very beginning of the Medal of Honor series, Captain Die has been taking his team through his infamous boot camp, and this game is no exception. Time out. Yeah, when you go. Come on. With every new crew that works on the Medal of Honor franchise, it's been kind of a tradition that they have to run through a bit of what I put actors through. Four, five, six. Stop. You just say, sir. Sir. And you say it after each count. Continue. I want them to understand. I think that's part of building the legacy of Medal of Honor. I want them to suffer a little bit, not even close to what the people they're depicting suffer. But I want them to understand what it is to be a soldier and then bring that to the game. Ultimately, it is the process of working with Captain Dye and several other military consultants that help bring the game to life. It's really great working with each and every one of our historical slash military consultants because they understand the subject matter that we're making a game that we can only go so far into realism without impinging on the fun factor. Going through Guadalcanal, we're not going to give the player muddy socks and, a, and gangrene and, <laughs> and malaria, right? But they try to fill us in on 
the feel of what's the historical significance of holding on to that island and the airstrip and the airfield. And to try and build that into our missions, it really makes a difference because even if 10% of the people don't pay attention or even 80%, somebody in there is going to get that. And one of our big things is for both veterans and historical buffs to go, hey, that's exactly spot on. That's right. But still have a fun time playing the game. Next month, we're going to look into some of the other unique processes the EA team has implemented that makes this game worthy of the Medal of Honor franchise. Repeat after me. This is my weapon. This is my weapon. This is my gun. This is my gun. This one's for fighting. This one's for fighting. This one's for fun. This one's for fun. Very well.